Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Hello, everybody. Oh, wait a minute. I just pulled an earphone out of my ear. <laughs> Put it back in. Hi, everybody. It's time for the ramble, and we go until uh, midnight uh, Eastern time here on the East Coast of the United States of America from New York City, New York, New York. The city's so nice, they named it twice. And also has a zip code, too. 10026, it's mine. Anyway, I couldn't remember that today for some reason when I was doing something. I'm forgetting stuff. Hi, how are you? Jeez, nice to have you here. Uh, we're going to have a lot of talk later on in the program, but as you know, the last three night, last two nights we've been uh, talking with Jack Garfine in another extended interview that we've done with him, and this one really gets good. This one gets down to his relationship with James Dean, his relationship with Marilyn Monroe, his relationship with a lot of the famous people at the Actors Studio, and I think we should probably get to it right now. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. That's the wrong uh, thing for me to push. Um, uh, let me go to the right thing to push. We take it right up here. So we're talking with Jack Garfine, and we're talking about... Uh, his initial time at the Actors Studio. And how long were you at the Actors Studio here in New York? How In New York? Yeah. Uh, I think until the 60s. Yeah. And the, so that would comprise how many years from the time you started with them? So, uh, 15. Yeah. Yeah. So you worked your way up from, uh, you, you originally went in as an actor because that's what the Actors Studio did. And yeah, then yeah. You but, s but I couldn't... I had an accent I couldn't do, but what happened was that the actor studio was famous for the individual actors in performances. Yeah. But there was never a total project. Yeah. That was developed. At and the you studio. created the first total so project. So I did this play by Calder Willingham, and as a man. Yeah. And what happened was that by the. Uh, um, I, they kept pressuring me, hmm. are we going to do it? They got frightened because it's never been done before. Yeah. And I said, no, no, you're not going to do it until I feel that it's ready. Yeah. So I rehearsed for months. Yeah. You know, and had every part was worked on very specifically. Right. And they gave up jobs at night. They, yeah. They really devoted their time yeah. to it. Well, the time finally came and I put on the show. It was the first time a complete show was developed at the actor's studio. So um, the people who saw it, even the actor's studio people, like I remember Alan Schneider saying, I've directed Broadway shows, Jack, but what you have achieved here is something amazing in yeah. terms of the acting, the ensemble work. Right. And then what happened was is that Ben Gazzara, a lot of the people, felt we should go and find a theater and do it in a small theater. But the point was there was no, at that time, there was no, you didn't work on a play off-Broadway that moved to Broadway. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. That didn't happen in 24 years since O'Neill's play, 24 years or 25 years yeah, before. Yeah, okay. But after that, and so when we did that, uh, ben Gazzara was particularly anxious, kept pushing me to do something, to get people that I knew to put up the money and, you know. And so, um, and what happened was that Strasberg, who was remarkable about recognizing talent right. and encouraging it and sometimes discouraging, but, but remarkable in recognizing that, but never would do a production unless there were names attached to uh -huh. it, you okay. know? Like when he did a Chekhov, he had Kim Stanley, Geraldine Page, but never unknown actors, you right. know? So finally, uh, uh, 
a girl I went to, to the dramatic workshop with came to see it and she sort of fell in love with one of the boys and she said to me that she just got an inheritance from her grandmother and she would give me the money to do the show. So I went and did production at the Theatre de Lise. And of course... Was this Broadway? Off-Broadway. This little, was Off-Broadway. Little, little okay. theater. Yeah. Off-Broadway. And uh, because that they did, but... And I did it Off-Broadway and uh, at this little theater. And of course, the critics came and the reviews were something fantastic. And even the one of the greatest critics, Stark Young, said it was superior to any acting done, you know. And Strasbourg got so upset that he wrote to him and said, superior than the group theater? And Stark, I have the letter, Stark Young replied and said, uh, yes, the group theater actors were good, but they had one patch too many. <laughs> I said, these actors didn't, you know. Yeah. So it was it. But Strasbourg didn't come to the opening because he was terrified that it would wreck. The, uh, we would talk about the actor's studio and wreck it because it didn't have any stars in it. Who were these actors, right? Right. So he didn't show up. So Ben Gazzara, about four or five months, no, about a year or two before he died, he was on a program with me. And I said to him, well, I have news for you, Ben. Do you remember the opening? Yeah. Do you remember the telegram from Lee Strasberg? Yeah. I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I sent it from Lee. I'm so sorry. I knew what that would mean to them, that he didn't show up. Yeah. They was unable to do it. And that, you know, and so finally what happened was the reviews were so fantastic that Again, this time we raised the money. Mm -hmm. Claire didn't have to put up all the money. And we moved it to Broadway. Yeah. And it was the first one. Didn't you eventually make this into what? a didn't you eventually make this into a movie? After the, the, didn't it become the no, strange one? What happened was yeah, so it opened on Broadway, great reviews. And then um oh uh, three or four years later, uh Kazan always Kazan was wonderful. He, he really saw the importance of it. And, yeah. And even when he, at the studio, you know, and uh, so, anyway, um, uh, after on the waterfront, yeah, Spiegel wanted to do a film, another film, and he asked Kazan about this production, which was then running on Broadway, and said, "Listen, this will be a great film." And Kazan said to him, the best director for this film is Jack Garfrey. And Spiegel said, what, the kid? <laughs> the kid? And he said, <laughs> the kid, he never made a movie before. What, what are you talking about? He said, I know, he never made a movie. He's the best director for this film. And so, and he said, and I'll, I'll be there if you need any help, you know. Yeah. And so Spiegel decided to go along. And Kazan got this great cameraman to agree to film it, you know, and um, and the film became the strange one, right? The film became the again. Willingham later was so upset because what happened was Spiegel sent out a questionnaire to entire staff of of Columbia Pictures. What's the best title for this film? And they wrote down what the majority said: the strange one. Yeah. You know, and Billingham said, if I had known that, I never would have let him do the film, you know? Yeah. But anyway, so then there was the problem with censorship, you know, because to me, I didn't think of of the guy as, you know, doing a film about a gay person, because this was a real relationship. In a sense, he admired the, the character of Gazara. Mm -hmm. You know, really, a real, a real caring love for him. Right. You know, and I, I wasn't going to go for the cliche. You know, about the feminine. If he's a feminine, he's going to behave a certain way. You know, and uh, and so he decided. So Spiegel decided to do the film, but James Dean got in touch with Spiegel and said, "Listen, he was already a star then." 
Right. I want to make that film. I'll be better than a Ben Gazzara. And Spiegel said to me, hey, Dean would like to do the movie. I said, I'm crazy about Dean. We're close friends. He's not right for that film like Ben Gazzara is, right? Right. And so I said, and anyway, so uh, then it opened. And at that point, at that point, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you, you say Dean was already a kind of a major star. Yeah. And so that would have been something to have him be in the film. It would have drawn a lot of attention oh, no. to the film. He, he, he was, Spiegel thought I was crazy. Yeah. Because most of the producers only think of money and names, not about talent, very rarely. Yeah. About talent. How know? did how did how did how did Dean feel about you rejecting him for the Who? part? How did James Dean feel about no, you? No, he rejecting? knew I rejected him before. Oh, we were, we were very close friends. You so know? you could reject him and get away with yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. What kind so, of what kind of person was what, what? What, what kind of person was he? Because all we have today is an iconic uh, uh, look of James Dean in our minds, but uh, there was a real person there that you had to work with. How was yeah, that? Yeah, there was a real person. Uh, one incident, <laughs> somebody in the actor's studio said that as far as improvisation goes, Jack Garfine is the best. Yeah. Nobody can yeah. do improvisations the way he does them and uses them. So after the session, this, you know, this, he said this in front of Strasbourg, you know. We went out, this is before he became a star, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, well, Jack, that was really great. But listen, it's something I have to tell you, I have to share with you, which is uh, the kind of death I have to face about my father. But you know, he got very upset. I said, oh, come on, Jimmy, it happens. Look what happened to me, you know. And then I put my arm around him and walked him to the hotel room. And he said, thanks, Jack. And then he looked at me and he said, how was that for an improvisation? <laughs> <laughs> and ran upstairs. Yeah. And I ran after him. And he locked the door so I couldn't. Now, how far into it, from the production of uh, uh, the Willingham play and the production of the movie was about four years, you say, the time between the two? No, about three years. About three years. So after three years, you were directing Hollywood films now. Yeah. Yeah. So then... And how old were you then? Probably 24 what? or something like that? What? Yeah, yeah. I was 25. Probably the youngest director in Hollywood. Yeah. But also, in between, I met Carol. Uh, that would yeah. be your, your wife. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, we should mention that, that it was Carol Baker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Carol Baker was, uh, Jack, uh, and I got to say, you must have been quite a winner because she had the, the uh, uh, reputation because of Baby Doll yeah. of being like a major sex symbol in America because everybody remembers her lying in that, Baby crib. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, what happened was uh, I had a difficult time because she was married when she was 19 or 20 to a guy who was actually a gangster. Yeah. And, you know, she, made, she was a dancer in, in, the, in, the, in a club, a famous club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he met her there. And then... Uh, uh, when I told you about it, we went to this photographer's place to listen to the stereo and the hi-fi. Right, right. A guy called Strasburg, not related to the other guy, but he was a friend, yeah. he knew them. And he said, Jack, I know uh, a guy and he's married to this young girl who, you know, is interested in acting and, uh, and I'd love to you know, help out if I could arrange a meeting between the two of you, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, sure, why not? But I said, it has to be work. I didn't want any. Uh, yeah. So I said, tell us you can do a scene for me and I'll, where she will do it and I'll go and watch it. So he calls me a week later. She's got a scene and in this place, you'd like to see it, she will show it to you. 
So I went there and um, she did from some very conventional movie mm -hmm. a scene, but I felt, ooh, not bad. You know, even though the material wasn't too hot. Right. I was, I said, you know, and I said to her, and I suggested that she study with Strasbourg, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, so she then uh, called me the next time and wanted to have lunch with me, and I said, okay, so we met in the Russian tea room, and she told me that she's unhappy with her husband, that they're probably heading for a divorce, but so she might not be around, she might have to go to Mexico, or them. and I said, okay, but, uh, so uh, the next thing, I think it's about a couple of months later, she called me, she said, well, uh, I'm going to Mexico, I'm divorcing my, my husband. So I said, well, I hope all goes well. I was into some more the Strasbourg class, very exciting, it's wonderful, you know. And, uh, and then she came back and I was with Peter Larkin at, at a cafe in the village. She called me, she said, well, I have, I'm divorced, I'm alone now. I said, well, you want to have a drink with us? <laughs> so she came down, we had a drink. Yeah. And then I started to go out with her and started to feel that she had real potential, you know. And the husband arranged for me to be beaten up. And I went to the police and detectives and then... Uh, they broke into my apartment, you know, and uh, she tried to talk to me. She said, look, we're divorced. What do you want? You know, but he had a lot of power. Yeah. The police, I, when I went and reported the police, the guy said to me, well, why do you fuck around with someone else's wife? How the hell did he know that? So I must have been told. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so um, what happened was that Kazan heard about it got terribly concerned and called me in and said, listen, uh, uh, some of the guys that are protecting me and on the waterfront, mm -hmm. I'll let them protect you, Jack. I said, come on, I faced bigger and stronger guys than that. I'm gonna get worried about this. And when he heard later that I was beaten up on the street, he insisted on having someone protect me. And I said, come on. I, who are these guys next to the guys who tried to do what they did to me? So you know what he did? Because you know? everybody thinks badly of him in many ways. Yeah. He called the district attorney and told him the story. And the district attorney said, listen, I, can't, I have to have an incident that's to occur. I can't just go to a guy, uh, arrest him or do something. And, and Kazan supposedly said to him, well, don't do anything. You'll have to face, when this kid gets beaten up on the street after the concentration camps, your career is done, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, he arranged, the district attorney arranged to have a hearing, but he staged it with camera people, with so-called news people there, mm -hmm. just to ask questions. Well. He, uh, her ex got so f terrified <laughs> that they will get at real things with him, you know. Yeah. He just wanted to know about the questions. That after that, he left me alone. I was okay, all right? Wow. And when I saw Kazan, I said, gee, God, you really helped me. He said, yeah, but I feel badly for you. Why, what's wrong? This story is such a cliche, you won't be able to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, so she became your she became your wife. Yeah. But I, I want to backtrack a little bit because you you, you talk yeah. about your the affection. What? I want to backtrack just a little no, bit. No, but let me just say one yeah. thing. So at one point, Kazan asked me. Um, yeah, I think I was I married. If I wasn't married, it was just before we got married. Maybe yeah, maybe I was married. Coming out of the actor's studio, he said. Yeah, he said, "What do you think about your wife?" What kind of actress do you think she is? I said, I hope you don't use her because I want to use her. He said, that's good enough for me, Jack. That's a great recommendation. <laughs> and so 
he arranged for her to read Baby Doll <laughs> at Tennessee at Williams' apartment with Carl Molden and Eli Wallach. How did you feel that at that moment, Carol Baker was the sexual icon of the moment because of that of that poster, just on on the yeah. poster for the movie? And if nobody's seen the poster for the movie, uh, I'm sure you can go online and see it. How did you feel? You were her husband, and you're the guy who's got her. Well, I was, <laughs> I was ambitious, and I thought my plan was when I saw that happening, I thought, okay, I deserve it because I saw this, recommended her to yeah. this, the studio, and I said, I deserve it. So I can do what I've always wanted to do. With her getting attention, that's how selfish that was. I said, I can get, for my company, movie company, yeah. have the yeah. money to do the films I want to do. I want you to tell a story to the audience, uh, uh, because you were talking about James Dean, yeah. being very close with James Dean, and you were, the, you were in Hollywood the day he died, and you have memories of that, of finding out about it. You said you saw him earlier in the day, first of all, I with his car? I was the last car? person to see him. He was in his car taking off. No, even before. We were so close. Yeah. We were so close because we were going to do a, a Russian play mm -hmm. on Broadway. Uh, yeah. A play by, um, I can't, again. Yeah. The, anyway, the, Cheryl Crawford was going to produce it. Yeah. And everything was set up. And I went to Hollywood. It was the last day of shooting of uh, Giant. Mm-hmm. And I went to the, his dressing room to tell him about the dates and what's happening. And uh, the Warner Brothers man came in and did his, you, you know, uh, clerical questions. Where is this? Where is that? And I saw Dean getting like that. So when he left, I said, hey, Jimmy, don't let people get upset. What are the clerical? That's their stuff. Yeah, but, you know. They, but, they treat me like a star, like an actor, but then they treat me like I'm occupying a space or something. And yeah. It was very upset. So I said, okay, Jimmy, so we meet in New York with Cheryl, mm -hmm. and we try to work out a, a date for the production. So I'm all excited about it, Jack. So where are you, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna go to the races. I said, Jimmy, please. What are you going into the races for? We have something planned we're gonna do. I don't want any her any any problems you know, for you to get into or anything like that. Jack, I'm not racing. I'm just gonna go to the races, okay? Mm -hmm. I promise you, I'm not gonna race, okay? So I'm just gonna do that. And uh, I said, okay. So you're just gonna go to the races, yeah. Okay, so I left, we kissed, you know, and, and then I'm at the, at the Chateau Marmont, and it's uh, late afternoon, no, no, early afternoon, excuse me, and, or maybe morning, morning. Yeah. And as I go out of Chateau Marmont, I see a whole crowd of people standing around, so I go to look, and I say, Look, what's going on? Oh, Jimmy Dean is in there. This is his car, and it's a racing car. I said, Jimmy Dean? Yeah. So I stopped by the car. He came out. It was wonderful. He saw me. He turned around and started to walk the other way. <laughs> I said, come on. What's going on here? Jack, I'm just going. I'm not going to race. Well, what's the car? I like to ride in a fast car, but I'm just going to go to watch the race and then I'll meet you in New York, right? So we shook hands, he got in the car, he left and then I went home. And in the evening, or afternoon I think, late afternoon, I went to watch the rushes on right. Giant. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting there watching the rushes when the door opens in the screening room and Elizabeth Taylor was just sitting watching 
the Russia suddenly goes, oh my God. I said, well, why is she reacting that way? And the guy, she sent something from the guy who opened the door. And the guy opened the door and she said, sorry, but Jimmy was just killed in a car accident. Wow. How'd you, you must have been devastated. What? You must have been devastated. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Just absolutely unbelievable. How do you think his career would have gone? What? How do you think his career would have gone had he lived? Oh, I think it would have gone tremendously because he really wanted it. Yeah. Like the Russian play he was going to do with me, he wasn't just going to be a Hollywood star, you know. And um, yeah. he read a lot. And his, also, Kazan heard him too, which I was upset with Kazan about it. Yeah. Because what happened was whenever Jimmy had his motorbike, and whenever he saw Kazan, hey, and Kazan would get on the back of the motorbike and he would, yeah. Jimmy would ride him. The same way Jack Warner called Kazan and said, your actor won't get off the set. He said, we have to close the, we close the studio, but he won't leave. So please get him out. And Kazan knew Dean and he said, okay, don't worry, I'm going and I'll stay with him there, okay? Yeah. So Dean wanted to stay to feel at home, to sense that this was his place. Mm -hmm. And Kazan had the sense that he wanted to do that, so he went and stayed with him. And so what happened yeah. after the movie, and Dean confided in me, what happened was that he was on a motorbike and Kazan was at the studio. And he said, okay, Gatch, come on, get on the back. Kazan walked up to him and said, Jimmy, the movie's over. I can't do that. I have my work to do. Right. Let me ask you this, and we'll kind of finish with this. Um, when did you meet M Marilyn Monroe for the first time? She showed up at the actor's studio? Let me just try to be specific. Um, yeah, you know, she came to a session of the actor's studio. Yeah. And I, I didn't even go to introduce myself to her. And that we she was already a star at the time, but oh, she yeah, wanted she oh, wanted to become star. a better actress. Oh no, yeah, right. Yeah. Big star. And yeah. so what happened was that weekend um, she was invited to Strasbourg's Fire Island mm -hmm. house. Eli Wallach was and so was I, and that's when I I met her and talked to her, but it's a very funny story. So we were having lunch, and Eli was there, and Annie Jackson, his wife, mm -hmm. and Marilyn turned to Eli, uh, uh, to Eli, and she she said, "You know, Eli, what's so wonderful about you? I feel like I have a brother." And Eli said, "Well, Marilyn, I hate to disappoint you, but I don't feel like I have a sister. You're my sister." <laughs> <laughs> right? And I was how old was I? I was 26, 27. Just a punk. And so I start talking about Stanislavski and Vachtangov and all that. And then after dinner, we're in the living room and I hear Marilyn saying, Jack, Jack, can you come in for a minute? Sure, I walk in. She's in bed under a sheet. And she says, what was that Russian guy's name? Uh, I don't mean Stanislavski, the other guy. Vachtanko, oh good, tell me about him. And she's naked under the, <laughs> under the sheet. And you, you got to know her quite well. What? You got to know her quite well. She knew me better than I knew myself. Like, after that weekend, we drove back in a car, we were, a mm -hmm. driver, we were in the back, and she turned to me and she said, I know why you married that woman. She didn't like Carol, you know. Yeah. I know why you married that woman. Why, Marilyn? Because, Jack, 
your mother wasn't there to say no, no, no. <laughs> you like Marilyn a lot, but right? You liked Marilyn a very lot. Much. I felt I had a lot in common in terms of how people treated us. You yeah. know? In, in in what way? You say you have a what? lot in common you had a lot in common because of the way they treated you. In what way? Well, people were jealous. Yeah, and so they would do, try to destroy things and humiliate you, and you know, and didn't appreciate things that you felt you were doing out of right your love for things, mm -hmm. but because you you were just a certain. In those days, are the Kennedys. See, in those days, you married a woman who never had sex, uh, was a virgin. You wouldn't marry sex. Right. You know, and here was a girl who they felt fucked everybody around the block probably so they felt they, they could get it too yeah you know but nothing to do with any humanity or with any concern so so how did you feel when you heard she died what how did you feel when you heard that she had died well I was very upset like even with Kazan there was a party at the Strasburgs and I was standing with Patty Chayefsky and she looked so amazing, Marilyn, that he kept, probably kept looking, and I too, I looked, it was great. Because I noticed, I'll look. He came over and he said, you wanna have that? You can have it. I, one time I wanted to hit him. Yeah, you were protective of her. I wasn't protecting, but I felt she was a human being who did certain things that out of, a real love or care and people thought she was just a whore you know well why don't we stop there yeah, and okay. maybe pick this up some other time because uh, I know that you're tired and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a Thanksgiving we're doing this on so we gotta go have ourselves some turkey okay great and uh, Jack Garfine is my friend and that is one of my proudest achievements in life believe me yeah. Jack and Alex is my friend. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Jack Garfine, ladies and gentlemen. Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. And that is our final uh, interview with uh, Jack Garfine. And uh, uh, I, uh, I just found it fascinating. I just found this last one fascinating. Um, uh, this is uh, this whole interview, the whole complete interview is available on our Roku channels on uh, GabNet TV and the GabNet Roku channel. Uh, and uh, if you want to find it in its full form, you can find it there. Uh, I was going to put it up on uh, our on demand, the, uh, the audio video of this. Uh, but I don't know if I'm going to or not. I haven't decided yet. Uh, I kind of have the feeling that if you didn't uh, catch it here now and you didn't pay attention to it, then uh, uh, why should I, you know, why, why should I reward you by making it that easy for you to find it elsewhere? Of course, you'll be able to find it tonight, the last one, uh, after the show, when we post the whole show, uh, whether we're going to post that whole interview uh, on uh, on the GabNet side, I don't know. It we, it is and has been actually for the last uh, about two weeks has been the, the complete interview on uh, the GabNet Roku channel and GabNet TV Roku channel. And if you don't have Roku, well, you know, you can buy one for like, what are they costing now? Something like 50 bucks or something? And uh, you not only get that, but all the other crap that goes with getting a, uh, a Roku, okay? Let me open up the, uh, the Skype lines here. And uh, I, I, th I, I hope you found that interesting, because I think it was fascinating myself. Uh, just the stories about James Dean and the stories about uh, 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 Marilyn. And uh, it was, uh, it, it, what, a, what a terrific life this guy has led. Now, you know, those are the two names you know instantly james dean and marilyn monroe but the other names he was mentioning there were if you're anybody who was into the theater was it was just an amazing um 
group of people. I mean, this throws off the name Pat Chayefsky, for instance, who came to write the movie Network and wrote Marty uh, as a Broadway show. And then, of course, it uh, was made into a movie that won an Academy Award. It talks about Elia Kazan, Strasberg. These are people who were the icons of American theater at the time. And Jack was with them in the middle of all of that as a peer uh, and considered to be one of the great Broadway directors. He went on to make two movies, uh, The Strange One, and I'm trying to remember what the other title of the other one was right now. Um, and it's the one he likes to be remembered for. I'll remember it later. It's just I'm still loopy. And uh, he, made, uh, he made two movies in Hollywood. Uh, but it didn't, I want, I, and I want to get into that if we ever get to sit him down for another interview. You know, this is a touch and go thing. He's a really old guy. He's fragile. He gets worn out easily now. And, uh, I would love to get him back in here to talk about his whole relationship with, uh, with, uh, Columbia Pictures and why his films had problems at Columbia Pictures and uh, but maybe we can get him at another time on on that. But uh, you know, anyway, guess guess who's here? Uh, that's uh, that's Phil. He's here today. Hey. Yeah. Guess who's coming to dinner? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Guess who's coming to dinner? Yep. 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 How you doing, Phil? Oh, good. Uh, you know, I uh, I listened to the interview. It's yeah. very good. I'm I'm going to listen to them in, in their entirety, though. Uh, you know, without uh, you know, the days apart. Yeah, well, you can go on to Roku and do that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'm going to post them on GabNet itself on the site, but... Uh, uh, why don't you uh, put them in the GabNet store and, uh, you know, let people uh, send a contribution. Oh, to yeah, them. right, the GabNet store. <laughs> that famous GabNet store? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I don't... The, the one that doesn't exist, folks. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, it's where, it's where you get your uh, uh, Gabnet mugs, Gabnet T-shirts, Gabnet hats. I have to tell you, that these these interviews that I've done with Jack have been some of the most difficult interviews I've done because yeah. it is it's hard when somebody gets as old as Jack is getting. Yeah, uh, they kind of have when you ask them a question, they have their own agenda in answering it rather than answering mm -hmm. your question directly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, do you yeah. think he has an agenda? Well, no, I, no, it isn't a question. I didn't, it no, didn't come across no, that. No, way. no, no. I'm not talking about agenda as a political thing or anything else. What I'm yeah. saying is, is that what, what, how how can I put it best? That, uh, that yeah, that, he has his own perspective. Well, no, it's not a perspective. It's a matter of I ask a question and then he decides he's going to answer it by going back five steps. You know, I asked him a question about well. Uh, what when what happened when you first got here in America? Well, let me first tell you about Europe, you know. Yeah. Rather than going direct, in other words, it he was, wasn't answering the question the way you wanted him. It to was answer. very he hard answered. for me to to structure the interview. Yeah. In a in a um, logistical sense. Also, I couldn't. You know, there were a whole bunch of problems. I mean, he's hard of hearing. You could hear the feedback from his. Yeah, uh, his uh, uh, hearing aid. Hearing uh, do you aid. think that because he was a director that uh, he would it's like trying to direct the director? Oh, well, he is currently they're making a documentary on him. Uh, French yeah. film crew is making a documentary. on. I've been go doing it for the last couple of years mm -hmm. uh, and truly an amazing story. Most of it is about I think about the concentration camps, if I'm not mistaken. But. Uh, you know, they've been making this thing and they've had to deal with him, you know, because he's he, he's trying to direct it. Right. You know, well, you know uh, he said something, uh, not in this last uh, half hour, but in a previous one. He says, you got a lot more out of me than uh, others have. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah, I think he yeah. said it in, in one of these interviews here. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it was the last one. No, no, no. It was in the one of the three. Uh, I think it was the second of these interviews. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and and that made me happy to know. But mm -hmm. I was about ready to say, "What is it exactly I got out of you?" <laughs> you know, uh, because well, maybe it, he was more forthcoming with certain things than he was with others. As I'm saying, mm -hmm. the biggest problem that you have uh, that I that I had in that interview was just, 
you know, if I sit down, I were to interview you, I'd ask you a question, you'd answer it, I'd take you along a natural path. Let's say we were deconstructing your life. I would take you from, oh, where were you born? Okay, then what did you do? Then what happened after that? You know, and we would go in yeah. a logical path. With him, he kind of goes back this way, and then he goes this way, and he goes that way. You know. Did you did you have a uh, uh, a thing to follow, sort of an outline uh, with him, no. or no. Uh, it was no. free free no. flow? No, I mean, I told him that the first the first set of interviews we did were all about his time in the concentration camps and what that yeah. was all about and what it was like. And I'm sure in many ways to most of our audience, those were the most fascinating of the interviews, okay? This was about, I told them, we're going to deal with your time in New York and directing and going out to Hollywood and the people you knew and so on. And I, I definitely wanted to get in the stories about James Dean and Marilyn, so I kind of shoehorned yeah. them in there, you know? They weren't yeah. put in the logical place that they happened in, uh, in chronological order, Okay, yeah. uh, but I, we did it, you know, and I, uh, I, 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 I'm glad I, I managed to in some way document his life. But it, you yeah. know, um, it's it. I'm sure if somebody tries to interview me at that age, it's going to be the same way. It already did is you, with me. <laughs> did Did you ask him that if if he was conducting the interview, what would he, what would he ask, or uh, how would he no, set it that, up? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, uh, how can I put this? Uh, I wouldn't ask that question because I, I honestly believe it would be too complicated a question. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Uh, because at times when I would ask him a question, did you notice he would kind of go like, well, what do you mean by that? You know, And it was a simple right. enough question. I had to keep it in a very simple way. Hi, Jason. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Hey, it's only it's only Thursday. You usually call on Fridays. Well, that's because hey. ma recreational marijuana in Michigan is now legal, so he's celebrating all week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't but, it? They it's the first yeah. Midwest state to do that. Yeah. However, it's it, the first day that it's legal. It, yeah, it, that it's legal, but it will be a year they say before it will be sold. I yeah. Mean, you know, I was watching the news and they're saying so if you have a friend who has a medical marijuana card, they got to gift it to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but what now, I'm saying is is that the the idea of the non -com the commercial stuff going on sale is going to take about a year for them to get that into into yeah. play. Yeah, Jason, could your job be in jeopardy if you smoke? Oh yeah, pot? yeah, yeah. You know, if I were to smoke and get tested and show up positive for it, you know, it's, you know, it's it's a federal offense. You well, know, it's he, federally it's illegal. Well, here's the mm. problem, though. Here's the problem. You shouldn't, okay? But uh, uh, like, for instance, I say to people, well, you know, you, you if somebody's smoking pot on the job, yeah, they probably should get fired. Just like I would, you know, they shouldn't be drinking on the job. Right. Correct. Yeah. But the trouble with marijuana is the only way they can test for marijuana is to see if it's in your in your bloodstream and or in your hair. And it, and it, I what, think they well, whatever they do, it takes three weeks for marijuana to leave your system. Whereas with alcohol, you can be sober in a couple of hours and and most of it will have left your bloodstream. Why did I think the hair sample uh, it stayed in for three months? Well, the hair sample stays in until you cut your hair. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I I don't like the testing for marijuana only because it doesn't give you an indication of whether that person is high right they, now. They they have been trying out in uh, one of the counties next to me. It's a saliva test. So, if there's enough THC in your saliva, that means you just smoked it within the last couple of hours. Okay, that well, that's fair. So, I mean, but at the same time, You've even talked about what was it, the Cherokee test or the Cherokee experiments or whatever it was called. Oh, about. Is that, oh, oh, no, uh, that woman a, running for president? No, in, in uh, Port, no, in Portland, Oregon, or in Oregon, oh. they did some Oregon tests. These were many, yeah. many years ago, in which they tested uh, experienced marijuana users versus non-experienced marijuana users, and then put them behind the wheel of a car. And they found and, that uh, people who were experienced with marijuana. <laughs> could compensate for the drug not 60%, not 70%, but 
In other words, they could get behind the wheel of a car and drive it accurately. They said people who had never smoked it before, on the other hand, were a different story. And, and, and I'll admit, when I was younger, I indulged. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't know if I do younger or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, you, you know, I could straight up, you know, I could smoke, give it a few minutes and then, you know, go out and drive. And I was fine. I felt like I was more comfortable behind the wheel because I was more relaxed. I paid more attention, you know, then. But it, I know there was a point in time where I stopped. And then I started back up again, and oh, I was, I'm afraid to get behind the wheel. It'd be, just be like, you know, no, man, I got to wait till this is like half worn off before I could get behind I the wheel. I think I uh, had mentioned before that I had one toke over at a friend's house, and two and a half, three hours later, I drove in my car, and I shouldn't have driven. Well, uh, I, the first time I ever, uh, I ever smoked pot, uh, I was then driving home. And, yeah. and I shouldn't have done that either. If you're an inexperienced user, if you've not used pot, uh, and you don't know what to expect, actually, uh, it's a very hard thing to compensate for. This is a drug that they've shown through the tests in Oregon, at least, that you can compensate for, the, if you're experienced, you can compensate 100% for the effects of the drug if you have to do a task like driving, like operating power tools, you know, whatever it takes. But you don't want to. My feeling is when I got high, even when I was experienced, I didn't want to go driving. I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to just lie back and enjoy it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so why complicate it with a some kind of task, you know. Hello, yeah. oh, Jeff. I... Hi. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. I had hemp today. Mm. Uh, I had a hemp-infused vodka in in my Bloody Mary at lunch. <laughs> so, Could it, you it even taste anything, or you just paid for it? <laughs> I just paid for it. <laughs> it, it was tasty. I mean, uh, you know, they, they had all sorts of other stuff in the Bloody Mary. You know, I saw so. it at Costco. They had, it was called Hearts of Hemp. Yeah, it, they're like the inner parts of hemp seeds or something that you're supposed to use as seasoning. And it was a big, huge bag of it at Costco. It was, it was, it was, it was <laughs> some awkward. of it, it, Well, I we don't have hemp yet at, at our Costco. Uh, yeah, yet. Well, it's it, it's coming, I guess. I, I you look around; it's probably there because <clears throat> this was before today. It became legal. It was like last week. I saw it there. I, well, it may be that the hemp, you know, there uh, you can. There's no THC in yeah, it. Yeah, you can make it so your hemp doesn't have any THC in it. Correct. So that's probably. Yeah. That's and, probably and, and this was. this vodka didn't have any THC. Uh, the 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 waiter told me that. Uh, I said, ah, just you know, he said it was called the Mary Jane. I said, <laughs> okay, I'll have one of those. <laughs> so you know, why even infuse it with uh, with hemp if it doesn't do anything? It, there may be a taste, uh, you know, but I didn't there, know probably. what to look for uh, as far as the taste. So, you know, it tasted good. That's that's all I, I knew. Know that, uh, you probably have to have a very you know mature palate in order to yeah. be able to taste it. Too. I, I didn't I didn't have any reference to, uh, you know, to, to put uh, across it to, to know what it was or what it wasn't. Uh, but yeah. the, the guy had uh, well, it was actually dinner. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we went to this uh, oyster bar and uh, buck an oyster, uh, down the uh, twenty oysters between the two of us. But uh, he he was, so was talking it twenty bucks. <clears throat> well, it was actually seventy bucks by the time we got done with the chicken so wings it's and really the not uh, a buck oyster. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, all the other stuff and the drinks. But uh, uh, he was talking about a place in New York, Alex, that was near your old apartment called the Free School. Uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, he said it was, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a Paul Kasner and uh, Paul Krasner. Krasner, E. Krasner and a bunch of things. And, and he it was on uh, six. It was on 14th at sixth. And uh, sixth. Well, uh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That, but that was that was in the 60s. Back in the 60s. Yeah. The free school. Right. It was uh, it was actually on this. It was right in the. Right next door to my apartment house on the, yeah. I think the second floor, maybe the third floor. And the uh, living theater used to do some stuff there. 
and so on. But uh, I don't know why, they, it, but I do remember the name now, the free school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, yeah my friend was involved uh, with that and all of those guys. And he said that uh, uh, Abby Hoffman and uh, a number yeah. of those other people were all part of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I used yeah. to go there with them. So. Yeah, I, yeah, I, he I, said he I, saw I don't, you there. I don't know why, I, yeah, I don't know why I vaguely remember it, because yeah. you would think it would be something that would be in my mind, but now that you mentioned 6th and and uh, 14th, 14th. And, and now I remember it was either on the second or third floor. Well, and, yeah, because, uh, yeah. you know, I said to him, I, I said, oh, well, I knew somebody that, that lived on 14th, and uh, uh, he said, who? And I told him, and he says, well, you used to go there. Yeah. Yeah, I met you there. Uh, he's right. I remember being there. I can almost remember what it looked like now yeah. that you mention it. Yeah, but yeah, if, interesting. If somebody had mentioned to me, "Do you know what the free school is?" I'd go, "No." It's one yeah. of those things that you don't remember. Isn't any that longer. before kindergarten? <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing's free. <laughs> I, I don't think it was much of a school either. But I do. No, think, it, yeah. it had to do with uh, a, a bunch of uh, uh, revolutionaries, I yeah. guess. Well, yeah, it was revolutionary theater. I mean, the, the uh, Living Theater. Uh, mm -hmm. Judith Molina and Julian Beck took place there. Yes, Jeff. Yeah, my sister used to. When she went to medical school, or she was a nurse, uh, on 14th and 5th, I think she went to school there. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was a school there anymore, but I remember going there quite often. Uh, well, Sticks also, I can't remember why. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that it was actually a school. Yeah, but yeah. that's what they called it, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I vaguely remember the name. I do remember mm -hmm. the space, however. You know, and oh, I do know what he's talking about. And yes, he, I'm sure he saw me there. Yeah, he did. You know, <laughs> he said, uh, yeah. "We used to go." Hey, you know, and I, I didn't volunteer that anything. He just said, uh, "You know," he says, "Who lived on uh, 14th?" I said, "Alex Bennett." Said, uh, "You know, he knows you. I get he's one of your Facebook friends." And uh, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I vaguely remember one of the events I talk about in my life was the night that I met up with. Uh, John and Yoko, mm -hmm. and I had uh, been kind of mad at John and Yoko because they had promised some money to the Living Theater, which was a, this theater group I just mentioned, mm -hmm. and uh, they said they were going to give them some money to help them out. Yeah. And, and I was told by one of their members that they never came through. And uh, I had been then putting them down for that on the air. And so they came over to me at this party. And if I remember correctly, I mean, it, it's very vague in my mind, but I believe it was at the free school was really? where, the, where the gathering was. And they came over to me and they said, Alex, we hear that you blah, 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 blah. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, you guys got a lot of money. I said, you don't have to give any of it to anybody. I said, and I'm never going to hold that against you. I said, but if you promise it, People are then counting on it, and you'd better come through. And yeah. the next day, they wrote out a check and sent it to the Living Theater to help them out. He said, you know, don't just don't tell people you're going to give them money if you don't want to give them the money, you know? Yeah. And But at, I remember my immediate thought the minute that John and Yoko walked away, I looked over at my then wife, who I think, or girlfriend, oh, maybe it was my wife, maybe it was Ronnie, for all I remember, <laughs> and looked at uh, at them and said, uh, gee, gee, I just had my ass kissed by a beetle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, very cool. Because they came over to me and they were very apologetic. And why are you mad at us? And oh, you know, we, we think the world of you. And, you know, of course, Yoko was the one taking charge of the discussion because she took charge of everything. You know, she took charge of the money. She's very smart. Very smart woman. Very bright. You know, I was always, my, I was always very pissed when people would say nasty things about Yoko, uh, because uh, I had to always tell people, hey, you know, she's very bright. She's very smart, and she's very talented. She was a very talented artist. Her art career was ruined by John by marrying John Lennon. Yeah. Well, she was uh, uh, very early on in the uh, Brooklyn uh, uh, remodeling renaissance. Uh, bless you. Uh, you know, taking uh, those uh, buildings and converting them uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, 
And she also restored a number of places, including in Matthews, Virginia, a lighthouse, the oldest lighthouse on the East Coast, and then she donated it to an orphanage. She's very generous. Well, she, she's also uh, very good with money. Uh, yes. Her, her father was uh, a banker in Japan, and so oh. she learned a lot about banking, and so she knew a lot about handling money as well. Um, yeah. And so... Uh, but her, her her talent, I mean, as an artist, I, I thought she was one of the, if you want to talk about avant-garde artists of the time, I think she was one of the best that there was. She was terrific. You know, I even created an artwork with her once. Uh, yeah. I mean, but I found her just prolifically interesting. And yeah. then she went and started doing all that singing stuff where she would shriek and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And people would call me up and put it down. And I used to say, I said, you mark my words. What she's doing or attempting to do right now with music, 10 years from now, everybody will be doing. And you're right. And yeah. John Lennon said, quoted, literally quoted me years later, saying that Alex Bennett said that she would, someday everybody would be doing what she was doing. Then there were people like Lena Levitch and so on who did exactly that, who had hit records. You know, yeah. What about what her kid did? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, well, her, her kid is uh, artistic too. He did a series uh, of um, bronze that my uncle uh, worked with him on. Uh, and, did he have an album? No, you're thinking of Julian Lennon. Yeah, Julian, Julian. Lennon is not by Yoko. Sean Lennon oh, is uh. is their son by the two well, of them. Which one did the uh, the the bronze exhibits? Uh, it could have been Sean. Yeah, Sean. Yeah. Okay. Because you know. uh, uh, also uh, Mitchie, my uncle, did uh, a lot of work with John Lennon when he was alive on his Bag One series mm -hmm. and yeah. and bronze, and uh, and he also also worked with Keith Haring. My friend Al Goldstein. Yeah. What happened was John Lennon came out with this Bag One art thing. Right. Where there were like something like 12 lithographs, and you bought them, and they came in this burlap bag. Okay. Hey, for and, the younger people, what's a lithograph? Well, no. <laughs> uh, uh, That's no, a classic this, way of this, printing. This isn't really for young people because they still do lithographs to this day. I mean, lithographs are, uh, it's a limited form of printing in which you don't do a huge number, you know. Uh, is that what is a certain media? It, it, it's, like... it's it's done in reverse, and you make a block, and and I don't and, know and that, not, that that I don't think is what lithographs are. Yeah, and then you press it. Uh, oh, this is a form of printing. It's a form yeah, of actual. So printing. is so is so is. I think taking you, the yeah, the block, I'm inking it, and then you may be right, Phil. Maybe somebody can call us up or tell us huh. what lithograph is exactly. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Al Goldstein bought all, uh, uh, one of the bags, and they were like twelve hundred dollars. Okay, and I always used to say to him, "Why the fuck did you buy that? You know, come on." And it was artwork by John and Yoko. All right. Mm -hmm. Five years later, that whole bag was worth close to fifty thousand dollars. Okay, I. And to, and now in this today it's worth a hell of a lot more. What yeah. you got looked up lithograph on your little of course phone? yeah uh, lithography is a method of printing originally based on uh, uh, oil and water the printing from stone or metal plate with a smooth surface it was invented in 1796 German author and actor can't pronounce it as a cheap method of publishing theatrical works hans See, gustav I, litho I, I told you for the younger people could you explain it please but wait a minute i got a better i got a better answer for you echo yeah. what's a lithograph <laughs> you've got wait, that in the room wait, wait. Duplicate or that prints by lithography, a flat surface, a stone or metal, is treated to absorb a repelling in the desired pattern as a verb. Lithograph can mean make by lithography. Okay. So, so is that almost basically a stamp? Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And it's usually a limited number. And it'll usually be numbered like, you know, if they made 100 of them, it'll be like 25 slash 100. 
mm-hmm. you know, and uh, makes sense. Yeah, oh, because if, if they make them limited, they they're worth more. You know, but yeah. but they're not worth. Also, as- the plates the plates can only produce so many uh, until it loses their uh, its um, uh, cleanly uh, crispness. I, I guess. Yeah, I think it schmooses out a little bit. It's, yeah, you know, it it's thick in certain spots and thin in the other, and it's not as uh, the the printing is not as, as it's, it's not as sharp. Or, yeah, yeah, not sharp anymore. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, the other thing is, is that of course there is silk screen, which yeah, but uh, that that's for photography with ink. And you you lay this silk screen on a on on some item, and then you schmooze the uh, each color. Yeah. You you wave it across the screen. Right. Well, what happened was uh, Andy Warhol used to do silk screens, mm-hmm. and a lot of his famous ones, like the electric chair and things like that, are really got a lot of money. Well, I had this friend who took over the space that was one, that was called the factory where Andy Warhol did a lot of this and he had these silk screens but what he did is after he made say the 25th one or whatever he would then take a knife and slash through the silk screen ruining the art so mm-hmm. no more could be made my friend found that if he tried to sell the silk screens he could get a good price for them even if they were slashed <laughs> so <laughs> There's your art world for you. Yeah. You know, you remember just recently there was a guy that sold a piece of art that was like $4 million that went for at auction. And once the gavel went down and it was oh, sold. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you know, you know who that was? That was, that was what's his name? That was. Uh, 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 it was recent. No. Uh, what? Now, yeah. my mind is such a blank today. God, I can't man. think of the name, too. But, yeah, it was just a couple of months, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, last couple of months. Well, it's the guy who does stuff on walls and stuff. Uh, oh, uh, you mean a, a graffiti oh, artist? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, this looked like a serious piece of art. Yeah, well, and he, he Does made, somebody he, just say someone was in a folk or something like that? No, 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 no. What, what's, come on, what, what is wrong with me? I know his name like I know <laughs> who, my Who own. can remember that kind of shit? No, I mean, <laughs> you know? I've been taking this gabapentin and he's been making me just lose all sense of memory. Yeah. But, know? you know, what, so what happened was in, in the frame was a shredder. And as, and as soon as they right. as, soon as soon as, as it gavel, was sold, as soon as it was sold, the thing it, it went down through the shredder. Yeah. and it was and they said it was worth more because of that. <laughs> it's just you know, it's amazing. Something e e y. Uh, oh God. S D. No. 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 And Tony's calling. Tony won't have the answer. That's for damn yeah. sure. <laughs> uh, 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 um, oh God. What's his name? <laughs> You know, he, d- he did artworks here in New York City where he would stuff would show up on pavements and on the sides of walls. Oh, Banks! Oh, Banks! Human- Banks! He Banksy. came up with yes, it. Yes, that's he it. Came Banksy, up with here, Tony knew. Yeah, no, that was Banksy. <laughs> I just found it too. <laughs> yeah, it was a Banksy. It was a girl with red balloon. Banksy yeah, shredded poster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the person- of Banksy. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, and, and the question oh. is, the question is. How much is that shredded work worth? Well, it was worth four million before it shredded. <laughs> well, is it still worth something? Because they said that, it's that worth part more. Of the art is it, that it not part, the, yeah. is that not the completed work of art? Yeah, yeah. You uh, came the, up the with fact it. That it shredded. Tony, when you when I saw you were ringing, I said Tony won't have the answer. And you had the answer. <laughs> I love when you were talking about that artwork. I love that stuff. I I like reading on that. Yeah. Yeah. Son of a I'll bitch. go to. That was a great buy he had, Alex. Oh, yeah, of course. No shit. Holy moly. But I, I derided him for it when he bought it. I said, yeah, I, I, bucks like, for oh, this. I love any type of original type stuff like that. Hey, see, it's because of Tony. Now I know what piles are. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't get them. I, I, I had to ask my parents because, you know, I just figure it's an older person thing. My parents are the same age as you, Phil. And my mom had no idea. And my, my dad did. So I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, so whatever. Uh, well, I missed last night's show, uh, but I, I, we had our annual photography banquet. 
And at that banquet, they took all the winners from the last 11 months and they had another judging. And uh, a piece that I submitted, and, you know, I, I won because I was basic. It turned out that it was best of show, uh, first, uh, first place, best of show for everybody the whole year. So I beat those old people again. <laughs> yeah, but you're taking advantage of them. No, nah, some of these guys are unbelievable. They fly all over the world, and they got, they hire photographers to show them the best places to take the shot. And uh, you know, yeah. some some of them have more money than God. And uh, you know, I I went with John Parolis to a uh, MMA match, well, to begin with, and he gave me name, access, and that was the Parulis. one. The bloody the bloody MMA match thing was the one that won. How many his people are in your club? Congratulations. Uh, there was a hundred there last night. And uh, but there's probably uh, 180 that uh, belong, yeah, yeah. and then uh, uh, there's 14 Northern California clubs which we are a part of, and so if we win at this one, then they send them to that to compete with those. Mm. And uh, I've done okay, you know. I've, I've had a couple of firsts, yeah. a couple of fifths, <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, uh, a few. Yeah, yeah. Sounds boring to me. Anyway. Uh, Everything you're, sounds you're just, boring you're, to no, you, you're beating, unless it's about you. You're <laughs> fucking beating up on old people. I don't approve. Oh, of yes, that. absolutely. Hey, what are they like? Five years older than he is? No, no. Some of these people are in their nineties. There, there's a woman that sat at my table. She's ninety-five, and she's amazing. And uh, she gets out there. She takes. She she refuses uh, to do. A, she does. If there's a ladder you got to climb up, she'll climb up. We were on a uh, ship, uh, a Coast Guard ship, uh, during the uh, Fleet Week, and she was on that same ship. Uh, and there's a ladder. I almost didn't climb up, but she climbed up at 95. Unbelievable. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. Son of a bitch. Well, that's, that's good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, she- you know, you always ask me about uh, uh, television shows. Yes, what do you got from To begin with, we just got through uh, uh, binge-watching Mrs. Maisel, the second season. Oh, 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 it's out already. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I knew it was coming out on the fifth. We wondered as we were watching it whether it was good as the last year, and then by the time it finishes up, we went, yeah, it's as good as the last year. Yeah, I mean, it, it, as opposed to eight episodes, there. Uh, where where's the audience going tonight? Fuck all of you. Um <laughs> It's down to like 20 people or something. What's that all about? Well, you mean and, 20 watchers? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't matter. That. Uh, who cares? Who gives a shit? I mean, I, uh, anyway, I let download me, let me, you let me, on uh, Apple, you me, know, me, iTunes, yeah. so you can't see me when I'm watching yeah. or listening. Yeah. And so yeah. there's more people out there listening than you think. Anyway, let me. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Maisel is, I think, this year just about as good as last year. I, uh, But you. But, it takes a while. It it doesn't. Uh, you know, they go to Paris, and there's a the second episode's very nice, and then it kind of wanders around a little bit. Then they go to the the Catskills, and you know, and you don't know where what's going to happen there. But eventually, that kind of starts working, and then it starts getting more and more and more. And finally, at the end, it's really good. It's really good, and uh, uh, so I I would suggest uh, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel for another go around 10 episodes this time as opposed to eight and a show that we binge watched that everybody told me you got to watch this show you got to watch this show and when people keep saying you got to watch this show i'm always going eh fuck it <laughs> you know nobody's going to tell me what to watch but we finally got around to watching killing eve has anybody seen killing eve oh, let me see that you is got, that a uh, like Netflix? No, Please no, elaborate. no. It's USA, What's it about? BBC America. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And if you so have, it's Hulu. You got to go Hulu, right? Hulu. It's who. Uh, it is on Hulu. Or as a matter torrent. of fact, I What's I, I pay for Hulu with no commercials, so we could watch it without commercials. <laughs> it is nothing short of incredible. Cool. It is just everybody that told me you should watch this were absolutely right. Uh, it's terrific. Is it a liter- in a literal sense about uh, Eve as an Adam and Eve, or is no, it a metaphorical no, reference? No, to it's something? about a about a, a woman who works for the MI5 named Eve, 
and okay. this absolutely crazed uh, killer for this group of people. She's a woman, and she is just loony. I mean, it's so well played that it's just incredible. And it's about it it's about the MI5 woman trying to find this assassin, and the assassin finding out who she is and trying to find her. And it's it's really it is. Now I, I, MI5 is UK's version of the FBI. More like CIA. the CIA. More like CIA. Or is that MI6? That's the, their version of the FBI. Well, I thought it was MI5 and MI6. The M5 is a highway that goes to uh, I know, but MI5 is, a, or MI6, <laughs> I can't remember which, but anyway, it's a great show. Watch it. Oh, it sounds good. I just It's, just, it's amazing. I, I just it is confused. amazing, and the performances by everybody on that show are just amazing. Yeah, yes, Jason. Yeah, watch uh, F is for Family. Oh, I love that show. No. <laughs> Put you through that fucking wall. <laughs> <laughs> right. it's, it's a good show, especially if you were to have kids or something. You know, I had but, a job you know. interview today, and we were talking about that in the interview process. And I was telling the guy that, that was interviewing me, and I'll tell you guys, my father had a variation of, uh, of that phrase, you know, instead of, I'm going to put you through that fucking wall if you do that again. It was, if you do that again, you and I are going to tangle ass. So, you know, I can understand where that where that show is coming from and where Bill Burr's mind is uh, coming from as well. With those, kind of inter with those kind of interview questions, did you get the job? <laughs> <laughs> For all purposes and concerns, I did. And by so the way, Killing Eve, th this year's uh, run of was it Killing Eve. Was an Uber driver? Uh, uh, Killing Eve yeah. uh, has been nominated for Best Drama at the Golden Globes. So, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I wrote it down this time. Uh, uh, let's see. Ryan, is, that, is that a piece of art behind you, or is that a thing that holds batteries? What's right, you what's Brian? right in back Brian. of you, Brian? Oh, you're talking to me? Yeah. yeah. Well, what's going it's, on? It, it, right next uh, to your head. Right behind you, there's something that either, either yeah, holds batteries right or it's an interesting piece of art. It holds it holds various si batteries of various sizes. I bought it on Amazon. They used to sell them at what we call Giant Eagle, your version of Kroger, or so, somebody's version of Kroger. It's a regional area. It's a regional store chain, but uh, they have them on Amazon now. Uh, and these in Ohio, too. Pieces. Oh, oh, oh. There we go. Listen to oh, faster. Does, it, does it charge them or it just holds them? It holds them, and there's that tester. That black thing you see up there is a tester. I see. And why do you choose to put These. your why do you choose to put your batteries on a wall? Yeah, that is a good question. So I know where the fuck they are. Oh, okay. well, I guess so. <laughs> Mine are in a cupboard. <laughs> They're right there. You can't miss them. Yeah, I just I, I, I guess I, I'm not one of those fucking uh, I'm not one of those fucking ooh it's kind of look chic baggots or whatever the fuck. Well, I you know I that would that would take care of all the batteries I buy because when I buy them I buy them at Costco and I get like forty at a time. Yeah, I got, yeah, got, I got a lot of these batteries. The double A's. Yeah, I'm from Amazon. I use rechargeable. And by the way, I, I, by the really? way, the batteries yeah. at uh, at Costco, uh, the way they're packaged. There is no way they, they don't package them so you can kind of dip in and get one. And you know, I gotta you, cut you, you got to open up. Yeah. The, you got to open up the whole box. Yeah. yeah. And then what I do is I take them and unload them into a zip lock bag. That's a good idea. Well, that's why I have this. So that yeah. whenever I pull them out of that shit, what Jason is showing us, yeah. then I could just grab one and at my convenience. Yes, but you don't. You can't fit. 40 of them in there. I, I use uh, rechargeable. I 40 of them well, you're a pussy. I use the E loops and uh, yeah. these. Uh, so I have a charger. I can charge eight at a time. And because uh, I just got tired of buying batteries. Well, you can you get know? tired of buying batteries, but I got tired of always trying to charge the fuckers because they didn't hold a charge for very long. Well, it depends. Yep. There, uh, there, you know, the packing material depends. I'm there's, with you there, Alex. There's, Huh? There's ones that disperse this the stuff faster than others. Uh, I I heard or read a uh, an interesting article on different batteries, and there are ones that have a higher charge, but they lose their charge faster. And there's others that, uh, and there's a specific way of knowing which one is which. But 
So yeah, uh, they they last for a few months, and then you just charge them. Yeah, uh, but the trouble is that uh, I. Uh, I, I I start I tried using rechargeables for a while and I just found them to be fucking annoying. They don't mm. last as long as regular batteries, and then you got to stick them in these chargers and you just sit there and they charge. And it, I just, it was just I would get those lithium batteries, especially you see you don't want the battery to go dead on you when you're underwater and you're taking pictures, and you got a strobe, you got well, two strobes. Well, I have a good so way you could do that, Phil. Just put new fresh batteries in before you go underwater. I do, but you know what those lithium batteries cost? Uh, you know, it's like uh, four of them are eight bucks or ten bucks. Yeah, so. Well, you know, I need uh, try try eight. suddenly getting getting one of those those rechargeables who that don't recharge for a long a fast a long enough amount of time to die on you. What are you gonna do? Plug in a charger underwater? No, I keep it on the boat. You know, I have the I have a charger on the boat, and this way, in between each dive, I just switch out the batteries. <clears throat> Don't be a pussy. Use regular batteries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're recyclable. Yeah. I think that I'm impressed that Phil's an environmentalist. You all of a sudden, he's, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm cheap. <laughs> so, I got tired of spending fifty dollars well, every you time speak I got environmental well, issues. Well, at Costco, at Costco, at Costco, I I get like yeah, what is it? I, I uh, am. Uh, 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 Jason had some there. That uh, uh, you get them at Costco, they're like fifteen bucks for like forty of them. Uh, I had uh, two batteries uh, in a piece of equipment. I took them out and I stuck them in my pant pocket uh, and uh, the front pocket. And then all of a sudden, a couple hours later, it uh, it they felt very hot and. Uh, uh, I guess they were touching in one way or another. They were triple A's, two of them. And uh, I, I, it was just close to having a fire. When I took them out of my pocket, they were so hot, I couldn't keep them in my hands. I actually threw them into the dirt. Were these lithiums? Uh, uh, these were rechargeable uh, uh, E-Loop triple uh, A's. Oh, oh, wow. Well. Yeah, E-Loop e is a Panasonic battery and uh, that, that are chargeable. Boy, the audience is disappearing tonight. I may just turn off the Why video. Why are you watching it? Oh, I just see yeah. it here, you know. And I get, You're worse than Trump. Trump Trump is saying, oh. oh, the ratings, you know, how many, my, my, uh, you know, I'm 50%, I'm this, I'm that. You know, you're worse than Trump. Oh, only 30 people watching. God, I need 40 people, you know. <laughs> that, you know I'm going to show the videos of the horses. Well, yeah. if you want to fill a stadium, have Bernie Sanders speak. Yeah, that'll fill a stadium all right. Well, it did. Really? Until he started gaslighting for Hillary. Yeah. But before oh. that, oh, yeah, stadium. Oh, why packed. would he be doing that? Because I heard that, uh, I thought I heard that he was actually already said that he's going to run. Well, I'm talking about 2016. He's going he to try and run in 2020? Phil, let me talk. When he lost the nomination, uh, was Cain, he lost the nomination was to Hillary Clinton in the primary, say what you will about that. But when he lost it, then he started uh, root. He started telling his supporters to vote for her, and they caught on. They realized that, well, like I do, he was fucked over. And A and B, Hillary Clinton is not you, or the the version of you that campaigned before you lost, and so um, they peeled away from him. But when he was campaigning against Hillary, oh yeah, those stadiums were filled. He reminds me of that guy Dean. You know, uh, no, that, uh, no, well, he's a not fraud. at all, not, not at all. Not, and, uh, you know, he had so much support from the youth. And, and, well, let me, and so let me, because he went, let me, I have, we, we visit some friends up in Vermont. You're talking about Howard Dean. Yeah. We, we're talking, uh, I, we, we have some friends. We, we visit these friends every year up in Vermont, Vermont. And they are very liberal people. Very liberal. Uh, and uh, they tell me that Bernie Sanders is a fucking asshole. Really? <laughs> That they can't stand him, that he is a he is an absolute fraud. So, and they've dealt with him. They've they've had business dealings with the guy. I, I don't care. I'd take him over Trump any day of the week. Well, uh, listen, you would take syphilis over Donald Trump. I'd take an anthropomorphic sack of pig shit. I, I, I would, you know, I, I did vote for Hillary, but I also voted for Bernie in the primaries, and I'd take him over her any day of the week. Yeah. I, I like Bernie. Yeah, I don't care I if he's a fraud. Hillary. As long as he's a fraud for me, that's yeah. good. But I, I like Bernie, too. I really hope he runs against Trump. 
<laughs> I, I do. I think he would try and tear Trump apart. I think that if he had run against Trump in the last election, Trump would have won. Nah, I don't. Absolutely. I don't, I don't, I think, that, I don't think he would have lost There, there by wasn't 3, only one. There was plenty of different surveys out there that showed that he would have beat him. When I talk to people from West Virginia, you know, the archetypal hillbilly types who say they <laughs> liked Billy Sanders, uh, 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 Sanders, Bernie Sanders, yeah, that tells me, yeah, he would have he would have wiped the floor with Trump's fat ass. I think well, I think you you're absolutely I think you're absolutely wrong. I think yeah. that uh, Bar Bernie Sanders was a bad idea too. I just don't think the Democrats came up with a good idea this year. And. And, and Jason, just remember all of those surveys that said Hillary was a shoo in yes. and there was no way that Trump was going to win. So uh, it's well, the same. Yeah, sponsored Phil, by corporate Phil, media Phil, that were neoliberal. They were doing, they were doing. Uh, I thought she did win. No, she yeah, did yeah, win. She did, she she did didn't win the election. No, wait a minute. Hold on a second. They weren't, they weren't, uh, those polls weren't testing for electoral college. They were checking uh, for people, uh, who will people vote for? And they no, predicted there, that, there were there were all of these guys saying no. that he has no chance of reaching two seventy. Uh, you you better believe they were going for the electoral college. Those were college, the people who they, were. In, they, there was this TV show. The people, that guy presses yeah, hold this on button a second. They, they they were they were uh, the the people who were doing the polling were polling on numbers. They weren't polling on electoral college. Those were the interpretations being made by wonks mm. over at MSNBC and so on, based upon those yeah, statistics. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the polls were right. I mean, she won that election, if you want to say the popular uh -huh. vote. Yeah, absolutely. The popular vote does not win that election. But yeah, no, right. I'm not that. I understand that, Phil. But what I'm saying is, what they were polling for was popular vote, not for electoral vote. And in that respect, they were correct. Yeah, selective memory. Yeah. I, you know, I'm telling well, you, all you, all those It wonks. isn't selective memory. She won by three million votes in the popular vote. <laughs> it was closer to four yeah, million. Those were, yeah. How many dead people did she win by? Uh, no, uh, 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 what you're doing is trying to rewrite history. Uh, they were all illegal immigrants. They're all yes. illegal Mexicans. Especially in California. This is the second York. time. This is the second time in in quite a, just a few years that the Republicans have gamed the system by by not winning by a popular vote, but winning by the electoral vote. And I think the problem is the Democrats. That's not a game. The, the, the Democrats yeah, never learned. Ne Democrats never learned how to play that game. That's the yeah. problem. Uh, they're going to get their chance. Aren't they going to be able to redistrict uh, now that they have the Congress? Yeah, and they're actually being smart about it, too, and pass passing state amendments about taking it, the gerrymandering out of the politicians' hands and putting it into independent uh, you know, people's awesome. hands. By the to way, say, I, I wish Patrick were calling tonight because I'd like to know what he thinks yeah. of what's going on in Wisconsin. Oh, you know about this. Governor? No, yeah, he responded. Uh, he had an interesting response to. Well, uh, wait a minute. Let me explain. Let me explain to the audience first. So in case they don't know what we're talking about in Wisconsin, the uh, 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 what do you call it? The assembly or the whatever. Governor. Uh, no, the assembly. Well, the, but the governor is uh, Democratic. The, Demo and the, he's the, the one state that, houses yeah, Let are me Republican. finish what I'm saying. He's coming in, and there is a Republican state house right now. I don't know if that's going to change uh, no, after, it's not. after not the first. Not going to change. What they did is they voted to le lessen the ability of the governor to govern. Same thing they did in North Carolina in 2016. They're, they're doing yeah. that in Michigan here too. Yeah, of course. They want to limit the power of the governor and the attorney general. They're allowed to because, according to Patrick, the Democrats did the same thing in 2010. These are Patrick's words, and I'm summarizing them. So, Patrick, if you're listening, please call in and chat. Yeah, well, if they did in 2010, they wouldn't be doing it now because it would already be I'm talking about the Democrats, though, when they were in control. Evidently, the Democrats may have been in control they, of the Wisconsin they, state legislature in 2010 and that they did the same thing. You know, it's... And it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it, it's one, it's like Crips or blood shit. That's but, the part. Yeah, and then the here in Michigan. pisses me off. In Michigan, too, they did a vote. They voted to increase the minimum wage to $12 an hour by 2022, I think. And, you know, $12 an hour for minimum wage, I don't think is that unreasonable. Well, but by, 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 what is it, by, by, by 20, wait a minute, when is this supposed to come into effect? 
By 2022. See, by 2022, that will be unreasonable. But <laughs> now the Republicans no, it's unreasonable now. just now voted to spread that on to 2030. Of course. You know, it, that's fucking ridiculous to sit oh, there and say, you know, because we surprised. were, you know, we, we had the votes actually to put it on the ballot to make it a state amendment. Mm -hmm. So the Republicans decided, mm -hmm. no, we're not going to do that. We're going to actually vote for it. And then that way, if we vote for it and pass it, it can't go on to the ballot and it can't be an amendment. That way we can change it after the election. So Jason, why do you realize that if the minimum ball. wage, if the minimum wage are tied to the rate of inflation, it would be 20 to $22 an hour? I don't understand I why a 16-year-old kid needs 12 bucks an hour. You know, just type that in on Google search. Well, we're, not talking about, we're not just, talking about we're not talking about sixteen years. That's who Phil. Phil. That's who Phil. earns Phil. minimum wage. Uh, yes, Phil. But, uh, also, maybe they could do something if you're under eighteen or you're still in your parents' house. There could be a different wage, and, and they could do that and should do that because that would encourage teens to get a job and go out there and learn the work environment and work skills. Now, I, I think that was my biggest edu one of my biggest educations was having a job at McDonald's. I learned yeah. so yeah. much about the workforce when I was working there. You know, it, and maybe you should be able to earn a little bit less if you're under 18 and you still are supported by mommy and daddy. But if you're over 18, you should not be able to work a 40. I, I had a friend. I, agree, I had a buddy that worked at a place called Jet Burger. And I, you know, and I figured, OK, I'll get a job at Jet Burger, too. And they paid the minimum wage. You know what it was? A dollar seventy-five. Yeah, right. what year? What year, what year Phil? Seventy. Yeah, seventy-one. Yeah, and you know, there the are, you, you're acting like it's just kids who get minimum wage. I got to tell well, you, that, there are a lot of adults out there who get minimum wage. There are people who are older people who work as greeters at Walmart that get minimum wage. They don't do it because they want to. They do it because they have to. Exactly. When I was sixteen, working at McDonald's, I think minimum wage was like three seventy-five or four dollars an hour. Wow. So, yeah. you know, it, it really, you know, We're about <laughs> the minimum the wage age. is only $7 an hour now, I think, or maybe $8 an hour. It really hasn't gone up that much as $7 much. $7.25 federal oh, minimum Hello to Ray Renati. What happened to, pa what happened to uh, uh, Tony? Tony? Did he just go somewhere? Yeah, he must have gone to his mother's. He, the picture of his room is she fell over or yeah. something. Yeah, it's, it's nice talking to a radiator. <laughs> yeah. No, hey, it's Alex, how's your girlfriend? How is she? Uh, she's uh, slowly, slowly uh, getting better by measures. Um, she's getting up and around the house a lot more, although at the expense of her leg at the end of the day hurting. But uh, today we got some new crutches that she ordered, the kind that have the little thing here and you hold on to the, It's a much better crutch. And she's yeah. getting around, and she's even uh, been, been been able to hobble around without the cane. So, but oh. it's still, after just a short amount of time, her leg starts really hurting, and she, uh, uh, you know, she needs uh, uh, to uh, rest. Uh, but yeah. you know, I as I told her, I said this is. You know, she thinks she might be able to go back to work next week, towards the end of the yeah, week. It's probably not going to happen. No, it probably will happen because we're judging what she, how she is right now. And she has a doctor's appointment on Monday, and I think it will be no problem getting into a, her into a cab now and getting her up to the yeah. doctors. And, I hope for her sake she's uh, right, but she comes off to me as but, like my mother. You know, she overestimates her abilities. But she be, she's been doing her work here from home, and, uh, you know, she she had to close the books for the end of the month and did it all from here. With uh, Guess who's back? Oh, there's Tony. <laughs> Where were you, Tony? Where did you have to go? I just gave my mother a pill. No. If, Hopefully if she's cyanide. Light. It's just like a Her final pill. Like final PM. Yeah. Final but solution. But anyway, thank, uh, she wanted me to thank everybody for all the nice things they've written her people in the audience and so on and how they've been concerned. I know that Jeff called us here at home the other day to inquire as to how it was. Phil's been very nice about it. I've heard from him. And I don't know who else she's heard from. I think she's been talking to Patrick about it, actually. She got some stuff she was talking to Patrick about. And uh, and who knows better about this kind of thing than Patrick? Yeah. You know, One of those, uh, I yeah. was pissed off that I had no shoes, but I met a man who had no feet kind of yeah. dynamics. Yeah. Uh, nice. Hey, hey, uh, did, uh, did she, uh, was she able to utilize anything be, uh, because the accident happened while she was uh, doing uh, work? 
Uh, I mentioned that to is her. Is her workers' comp giving her any? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we're going to need it. You know. Well, but, it's not a matter of needing. They may be able to give you additional things like transportation and other uh, things. Well, as that, for transportation, her company is going to pay for Ubers to work at home for oh, a while okay. until she gets better. Yes, Jason. So, like in Michigan, we have these things. They're called the Michigan van. You know, they're they're basically driving services that take you to the doctor and stuff, and they're yeah. usually always yeah. handicap accessible. You guys have stuff like that that she could just use instead? I think they have them. I don't think she's going to need them. Because um, yeah, I, I, the last oh. episode I was listening to, you're talking about, like, a, you know, if you could hire an ambulance. Well, no, no, if we, if we could, and and, and, when she was in real pain and when this whole thing occurred and we had to get her to the doctor, yes. Now I think uh, taking a cab is not out of the question, you know. Uh, uh, we'll see on Monday. You know, I'm going to go with her to her doctor, and we'll see how easily we get her downtown and, and back. Uh, uh, there are services called ambulettes, for instance, mm -hmm. that uh, that do this kind of thing, but they're not cheap. You know, they're pretty expensive. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Brian. I heard the Uber being mentioned and a dovetailing on that. Did you talk about how New York is uh, making Uber pay their drivers minimum wage? Yeah. Uh, I can't. I don't know that they're doing so that. I do they, know. They, I do know. Are they going to? They made. Are they going to classify them as employees? Evidently, they'll have to if that's what they're doing. Well, they're, all I know is what they're doing is uh, uh, they've limited the amount of Ubers now in Manhattan. Uh, Which is a well, you know, what happens is a guy goes out, he gets himself a, a, a yellow cab, he pays a, a, what about, I heard the oh, yeah, latest. Oh, medallion system. $200,000 for a medallion. They yeah. one That's problem. only because Cohen was involved well, and with this, those and this guy, And if this guy who drives the yellow cab no, who Phil, owns the medallion, they were, they he drove were, it for like 15 were, years, he paid they, a million dollars for it back then. They were a million dollars <laughs> back then, Phil. Not And that had nothing to do with Cohen. Uh, but uh, medallions are worth about two hundred thousand dollars. So a guy pays two hundred thousand dollars for a medallion, and then he gets like undercut by a fucking Uber. You know, some guy with his with his car who puts a little sign on it and says, "I'll pick you up now." In the early '60s, like maybe maybe 1961, uh, I remember visiting a relative. Uh, I, they said he was an uncle, or but uh, he he had a cab. He owned a cab, him, and Phil, in like 1961. Uncle. Uh, I remember the conversation was twenty seven thousand dollars for the uh, for the uh, medallion. Yeah, but they went up at one point to up. Uh, but and that's the thing too, though, is when these people take these or buy these medallions and the value of them goes down, the loan that they took out to buy the medallion doesn't go down. They still have to pay back the well, you know two hundred thousand dollars, even though it's only worth eighty. I had a I had a buddy that had a seat on the stock exchange in San Francisco, and uh, you would buy that seat, and uh, they would go up and down in value, and uh, you know because he was he was in a pit and he traded his own stuff. Well, I and, talk, uh, I talked to a, a cab driver the other day, and he uh, literally um, uh, rents his medallion that's on his yeah. cab for a thousand dollars a week. Wow. Okay. Can they generate that? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then he says, oh, yeah. and then I've got the uh, the lease on my car. You know. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so. I said, so do you make money? He says, some weeks, yes. Other weeks, mm. no. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I said, yeah. how's this week been? He said, terrible. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly a business you want to do. If if you're you're probably in better shape in a lot of ways if you become one of these green cars we have now. For years, we used to have the black cars, and the and God bless the black cars, because they came up here to Harlem when the yellow cabs yeah, wouldn't so come to Harlem, and if they did, they sped right through it. Okay. <laughs> well, finally, they decided to somehow take the black cars, uh, the gypsy cabs, as they were called and bring them into the system. And they did it by making them green cars. And what they can do is they can only go above uh, 110th Street on the east side and, and oh, 86, I think, on the east side and 110th on the west. And they can't pick up anybody below that. They can go below it to, like, if I want to take one downtown, but then they have to come back to pick somebody up. They can also work any of the other boroughs. 
So that's added uh, uh, people who now are able to have some kind of vehicle for rent but that you're able can to, make a decent little profit for them. You're able to flag those down, right? I yes. don't think you're supposed to be able to flag down a Uber. Uh, no, uh, you, no, you can't flag down an Uber. No. Yeah. No, they have to. But you can. All you got to do is tap into your, you know, your iPhone Phone. and see where there's one nearby and go come pick me up. And by the time I'm at the front door, there will be an Uber. I've never taken an Uber, to be honest with you. Uh, I drove Uber and Lyft all day today. Really? I shared an Uber <laughs> when I was in Tennessee. Uh, I don't have the app, but the girl I shared the, the, the Uber with, she did. And uh, we went to the uh, to the conference center. Uh, it was very. It was a nice experience. The person was nice. The car was clean. Uh, you yeah, know. Let me ask. Uh, let me ask uh, Ray this. You say you did, were Uber and Lyft today. How do you tell yeah. which one you are at any given time? Oh well, you know if they have a like, Lyft had a promotion going this morning. If I did three in a row, they gave you a bonus. So I started with Lyft. Lyft pays more. Uh, they don't take as much out, so I try to do Lyft as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And then when that promotion ended, like around 9 o'clock, yeah. I switched over to Uber. And then when it gets <laughs> slow, I put both of them on at the same time. And when I get a, a ride on one of them, I quickly turn the other one off mm. uh, so that I don't get... I don't have to like cancel something. Do, do you have that fun. mustache thing in your car that lights no, up? No, they don't have that anymore. <laughs> uh, the pink uh, mustache. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What? No, What's this? Yeah. Lift. Lift yeah, tell used them. to have a pink fuzzy mustache. It was about four feet long that you'd put on your bumper. It's a status. The, uh, there, no, there was also Super something that was in your window. Drive. Oh yeah, I used was, to have that. that. Was lit up. Yeah, I used to have that, but now they have like a regular looking lit up thing that's not so goofy looking. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that yeah. Does, it doesn't make much sense to me. I made like thirty bucks an hour. Oh. You know, it's. I try to do it smart. I got little tricks I do, but you know, now, it's not is good. That, is that is that profit? Uh. Well, no, that's gross. But then, um, the thing is, I got my car for free, so I don't. Uh, I inherited it, so I my only expense really is gas, and the car's a diesel. I've never had to. I've never had to do any major service on the thing other than put a battery and new tires. And I thought you were uh, uh, selling that back to VW. I am on December fifteenth wow. for twenty-seven grand. What do you mean selling what was it back? Is that a car that they want back? No, they recall. got a lawsuit. They they got not a lawsuit. They got what? It, what was it, Phil? They got uh, they. Oh yeah, they, they lied about their fuel standard the economy, or, yeah. and the yeah, testing. The testing for. Uh, uh, emissions. for emissions and yeah, so the, smog check yeah so they the, lied and they got they got they lost billions of dollars folks yeah. like because the uh audis some of the audis the jettas and the passats since like 1991 or something they've been uh as soon as you stick the little thing in the in the muffler it knows that you're doing a smog check and it gives a false read oh, yeah i heard about that yeah yeah and i have one of those cars so they have. I kept it as long, for two years. I, I'm, I'm turning in at the last minute because I wanted to use it as much as I could, and they and they have to pay me twenty six thousand four hundred dollars, and I paid zero for the car. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's okay. <laughs> so what are you going to do for a car you know, for a little? What, what, what are you going to make? Well, what are you going to use for brother, a car? My son has a car that I'm paying for that he does not use, so I'm going to start using that car. So you're going to start in using that car. Okay. Yeah, and, and so thirty dollars a day. You say you make thirty dollars an hour. 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 An hour, so yeah, yeah. yeah. It, is that... it turned out to be like twenty eight. I mean, it's it's not great, but when I don't have anything else going on, it's better than making nothing. Yeah, yeah. I don't so even, Alex, I, when yeah. you were doing uh, radio programs and you were making the big bucks, did you ever break it down to how much you were making per hour? Uh, yeah, I think at one point I thought about it yeah uh i'm i'm trying <laughs> Did you to break it down by the minute <laughs> I, when i was in sales at a software company well, go, go figure it ago, out i, I was making like i was i was hours. making i think at my height in san francisco three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year so you figure out how much that is an hour uh you were on for four hours that's about three uh, a day five hours? days a week <laughs> 
Yeah. You're gonna pull something. I mean, that was in, with everything that I made off of that show, of doing that mm-hmm. show. I, I think it, I, thought, I seem to remember something. I think something. that's about like $200 an hour. It was, huh? I think that's about 200 an hour. About yeah, but that was when 350 was 350 Oh, and you also weren't, weren't working eight hours. No, no he worked yeah, four. He only worked four hours. Oh, hey. so that's like 400 bucks an hour. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's about what I figured it out once to be. Yeah. Now, how many spots were on those shows an hour? Six? No, there were. At one point, what happened was the, the rating started. Yes, I have a follow up on that. The rating mm-hmm. started to falter, and I couldn't. Three hundred and thirty-six dollars an hour. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, I, I was working. Uh, uh, I was trying to figure out. Uh, what, what was the question you just asked me? Oh, see, that's uh, how pu- punchy uh, I am. Uh, oh, let's see. What the hell was it? Um, now you can't now, remember now, the question. Now I forget. <laughs> Anybody uh, remember what the question was? Um, no. Uh, what how much were you making an hour? Well, how much was I no. making an hour? But oh. then it was there was yeah. something about oh, oh, so, oh, oh, oh the number oh, of commercials. Oh, the advertising. Okay, no, how the many advertising. Spots? Oh. How uh, many spots? Uh, an hour. Uh, I'll tell you. The, the, uh, and the ratings started going down. Yeah. And when I first started that show, I remembered the amount of commercials at about 12 minutes worth an hour. Okay, so that's... Wait a uh, minute. Hold 24? on. Hold on. Don't start, ad- don't start adding it up yet. All right. The show became very, very popular, and I never paid attention to how many commercials we had every hour because they were always run from another room. Okay, I would go to the break and somebody else would play them. And one day uh, I was I, noticing I'm, I was noticing that it was taking an awfully long time to get back to me. Yeah. And I said, how many commercials are we running an hour now? And uh, the guy came back and said, oh, 21 minutes. Wow. And so, that's why the ratings started going down, because people got less programming. You know, and they would right. go away during the commercial breaks mm-hmm. and sometimes forget to come back. Now, most of them aren't 60 seconds, uh, are they? Uh, usually about 30 seconds. 30. So you, so you maybe had uh, 42 commercials. They made a fucking fortune off of me. And, okay? and what was the rate uh, for the commercial? I'm just trying well, I, to get I, at I, I can't begin, paying you I can't, 330 I can't an hour. Be, I can't begin to tell you, okay? Yeah. Because uh uh it varied so much over the over the years that I was there where the rate got higher and higher and higher you know what you do is if you've got a popular radio program you simply charge what the the traffic will bear and if you've got a very popular show and everybody wants to be on it you keep selling it at a higher and higher price until you see that people aren't buying it as fast you yeah. know so I, I, I remember at in your end, heyday at, the, at camel you had a six share, and uh, you know when the book would come out, it was a it was a celebratory thing because uh, you you had a big share. I, know, I never it had might a, even I ne- been I, higher than I never, six. I never had a six. No, I had uh, I think four point five was the highest I got it. Uh, really? Uh, it, okay, it, it, I, th- I thought it was a six out. share. But, yeah, uh, but it, it, uh, eight, eighteen to thirty five, you had the six. Yeah, but what happens is is that like for instance, when I say three hundred and fifty thousand a year. A great deal of that was in commercial revenue that I got money for because they were going out and selling me doing live pitches. And in one of my contracts, we made a deal where every time I did a live pitch, I got 50 bucks. And yeah. some and mornings, if you have the potential of 42 pitches an hour. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, they, they, they did a, a, a maximum of, of two live reads an hour. And some of the mornings I could make, uh, you know, four hundred dollars just off the uh, off the advertising. So that at the end of the year, that amounted to a nice uh, uh, amount of money, you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, it, it, you know, it was it, it was it, that was then, and this is now. Okay, so now I couldn't get that kind of money, you know. Even Nobody if I, does. Even if I, I accept. If somebody said, yeah. Alex, we want you to come do a radio show for us, they'd try and get away as cheaply as possible. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. Are you saying GabNet's being cheap? Hey, listen, he I, makes uh, double that on GabNet. GabNet, 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 GabNet are awesome, though. Yeah, They're better than Bitcoin. 
you know, <laughs> how they are. <laughs> well, you know, I, can, I, I can't begin to tell you the number of people who are in the radio business right now, and they don't get a salary at all. You know, uh, or if they do, it is so low, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, so, I mean, uh, the question is, is it worth to, to, is it worth doing? Probably not. It, do I want to do it? I would love to do it. But, you know, when you look at what I'm going to make, I mean, I go do uh, Walter's show, you know, uh, and he does, I don't get paid anything, but I don't feel bad about it because he ain't making money either. You know, so you know, KGO fired all these guys who were making a ton of money, and now they they have these people on there who are pretty good, but they hardly pay him a damn thing. I, well, I mean, by the way, by the way, you, you may not have listened change. to it lately, but uh, from what I understand, KGO doesn't have any local programs anymore. Well, they do on the change. weekend. Uh, they have like Marie Langham, the com comic, and uh, a couple other people on the weekends, but she hardly makes any money. I know she does it for almost nothing. The guy that you had a beef with, I guess, uh, just Jack uh, Swanson, is it? Yeah. Just took uh, took over uh, KGO again. He's back. Uh, so no, maybe no, he's so. gone already. He's gone already. Yeah, he's gone already. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, uh, he's gone already. They they uh, moved somebody know. else in now as program director, and there are no, according to Walter, there are no local programs on KGO. And it's too bad. I almost had you there. Their morning you know? show comes out of Sacramento. Yeah, and they play it twice a day. They play it in the morning, and they play it at night. The same guy. Yeah. I mean Armstrong <laughs> and Getty? Yeah. No. Uh, no, it's, yeah, right. no, no, it's Arm Armstrong oh, and Getty. No, no, they're in the morning. They're in the morning. Uh, Armstrong and Getty are doing their mornings, and they're coming out of Sacramento. No, I mean right. the guy after Armstrong Getty. There's a guy like after Armstrong Getty that he does. It's, and then they uh, it's obviously, the it, it, but it's syndicated. They're all syndicated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And the one great thing about KGO years ago was it was one of the few stations left in San Francisco that was all original programming 24 7. It was great. Yeah. Well, you know, they got ripped apart when this guy I knew, Kevin Matheny, uh, became the program director there, yeah. and I almost uh, I, I was I was putting him together with Alex because he had grown up and at WMCA his father was the uh, program yeah, director. And so what ended up happening was he says, "Oh, I knew Alex. I used to see him when I was a little kid in the hallway." He says, "I love that guy." And I said, "He's you know." I says, "Well, you know." So they almost got together and then he dropped dead he dropped dead yeah it's another one of my chances to get work the guy drops dead don't ever have anything to do with me okay if you're in the business yes kev uh, 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 kev uh yes brian yeah i'm just wondering and i've been wondering this for quite some time now because it hasn't happened yet at least to the extent that i want it to but how much more competitive uh would uh talk radio be when uh, or if um, online online uh, services like YouTube and and online streaming services become more mainstream and streamlined with the creature comforts available to you the way that uh, satellite and AM and FM radio are to you when they I, I, when I they don't come get, back to the I I don't get what you're saying. Uh, when on when when you're able to access online, forget online is worse. Talking uh, content online is worse than than terrestrial. I mean, do you, do you maybe you weren't here last night when I told everybody uh, the current number of podcasts on yeah. iTunes is? Are you ready? Six hundred and nine million. Oh, well, excuse me, six hundred nine thousand. Excuse me. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know the the cars now are coming out. They're Wi-Fi no, uh, uh, accessible. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. Six hundred nine thousand. There is no <laughs> way you're going to make money out of the fucking internet. No. Not unless you're I that guess, girl like, who gets a million hits for giving uh, makeup tips. You know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. What about that girl uh, that, uh, that was in Costa Rica last week? I guess she's got uh, a ton of Instagram followers, and uh, she rented an Airbnb and turned up dead. Uh, they they found her body. Uh, are you familiar with that one? I have no mm -hmm. idea. She a make a lot of person money killed a white American. Well, wait a minute. Did she? Well, have, she wasn't white. I did think she, she have a podcast? Hispanic. Did you have a podcast? Uh, she was an Instagram. Uh, mm -hmm. 
meme well, or uh, something. The way I look at it, it's one less person who's competition. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, the now if I can, looks at it, now, another brown person killed an American. Now if I like, can only get six hundred nine thousand other people uh, to do the same thing, uh, I, I have a chance of making it here. No, I wondered why it was harder to get an audience doing a podcast hey, than it was, say, five six years ago. You know, hey, Alex Jack says that he might want to retire to Costa Rica, so there might be another one, another less one. <laughs> Uh, really? uh, he, he he's not a good looking Instagram uh, uh, model. Hey, he might be to somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, but I uh, blind uh, people. Uh, pretty I, pretty limited. Uh, I, you know, I. Uh, uh, it, it's just that you know when you think about the internet as being this wonderful thing, you know, it really isn't. It, the only thing it's good for are the people like Apple, like uh, Yahoo like uh, 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 Google, uh, who uh, literally are the, the platform for these things. Those Although are the people I, making I the money. I use the internet, I use the cloud for my, uh, for my instead of a server, now uh, my programs are in the cloud and they're hosted uh, uh, over the you internet. You know, I really hate that term, the cloud, and I'll tell you why. Because there ain't no fucking cloud. <laughs> All right. It, it's if a it goes server. down, it's a cloudy It's a day. server somewhere. It's not a cloud. It's not hovering it's over not the one earth. server. It's but multiple it's, servers. Yeah, but it's not the ser It's not my server, which every five years needs to get replaced. But, uh, but no, I mean, I, I use the server for this thing. Uh, but I don't yeah. ever say I'm sending it up to the cloud. I'm sending it to the server. But they've yeah. come but up see, with this. We're there in the future. You won't have to buy any more computers. All right. you really have is a, a monitor. Terminal. Yeah. It's dumb terminal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was thinking about one thing about Kevin Matheny. Can you imagine if you got the job at KGO, you came out, and two weeks later the guy dies? <laughs> well, the way I look at it, at least I would have the job. <laughs> yeah. It would be up to the next guy to fire me. You know? Yeah. Well, they it looked like they cleaned house. Every time a new guy comes in, they clean house. It, 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 all these places clean house because they don't know what the fuck they're doing. You know, yeah. I, I wrote on one uh, professional site recently when they talked about that uh, Hubbard Broadcasting was letting go of I don't know how many thousands of people or whatever. And I said, you know, these things are going to keep going on until this industry learns that it has to change the way they do business. They have to come up with, just like when, uh, when TV came in, radio changed. Radio started playing music. Radio started doing talk shows. But now they've got the Internet, and they don't serve that function well. And they have to find a new place to position themselves to be successful. And they're not doing it. They're still trying the same old shit, hoping it's going to work. Oh, porn. They should do porn. Porn, yeah. yeah. Radio I'm porn. Learning. You know, I asked my friend Barry if there was something he could do for you and, uh, you know, with your format. And he said, and he programs five stations. And so uh, I said, you know, uh, what's the story? He says, nobody wants anything new in this business. And, they that, don't and that's want the reason why new. it's going to continue to die. Right. Is because nobody wants something new. And right. that's, uh, Jeff's left early. Uh, I think he went to the that, other room. Yeah. That's where I say, if you want to get back into radio, you need to practice. Thank you for listening to WWJ, where we produce weather and traffic on the eights. Exactly. On but, the you know, I mean, it's it's uh, it, it, there is no radio business out there. The only people who think there's a radio business out there are the people who own the radio stations and don't want to give up the ghost. You know, yeah, Jason, uh, my friend Barry used to program W four uh, in your area. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's it's impossible. Anyway, hey, listen, uh, that's it. We've run out of time tonight. Gosh, the, the show's gone by fast, and I'm still awake, uh, and uh, so are you guys. So uh, Call the Jack Show. In that case, we're, 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 we're ahead of the game when it comes to broadcasting. Uh, thank you, Jason. I really appreciate you calling whenever you can. Uh, uh, Jeff, love having you here. Brian, great having you here. Uh, uh, Phil, terrific. You know, we didn't even get mad at you tonight because we didn't get it. <laughs> we didn't. I think we mentioned Trump once in the whole show. 
Uh, Thanks to Tony Magno, and of course, thanks to Ray Renati. All of you guys are terrific. And what I'd like you to do is give a big wave goodbye to everybody out there. See you later, guys. That's our uh, citizens panel for tonight. Those are the people who make this program what it is. I just simply sit here and act as a ringmaster for what goes on. There'll be another ringmaster up here next. His name is Jack Bishop. He does a show called The Intersection. Then tomorrow night at 9.30, Damian Chaplin will be here with The intersection with the Exchange. And then at 10 o'clock, I'll be back again. Same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, if you see her, you know what to do. Tell her I love her, okay? Bye-bye.